Okay, so thanks for joining us for today's webinar. We'll get started. Uh, my name is Martin Mawan and I'm one of the regional directors at Canvas. For those that don't know, Canvas is a modern and intuitive virtual learning environment, or uh, also known as BLE, that enables training providers to deliver an element, if not all, of their training digitally. This is known as uh, for blended learning, uh, uh, so I mean, that's a blend of traditional face-to-face -face training with online learning. So, so Canvas provides a system that lets training providers to adopt this model of delivery. Uh, with squeeze budget, changes to funding, the new 20% off the job training rule, more and more providers are moving to Canvas to engage their learners, train and track their, their, their learners as well, whilst making cost efficiency, scaling their businesses, and increasing retention rates. QA apprenticeships have been using Canvas for, for approaching two years now and have been doing some really great stuff with Canvas and um, Ben Sweetman, Director of the Degree Apprenticeships is going to talk through this today. So if you can put any of your questions into the chat area within WebEx, we'll try and at the end and uh, over to you Ben. Thank you Martin um, and good afternoon everyone, thank you for joining. It's very, you know, when you put yourself up for a steel webinar you're always terrified that uh, two people will turn up, so I'm very pleased to have more than two. Um, let me just give you a sense of where I am and uh, what I look like, so you get the slides as well as that to look at. Um, and I'll close this because you probably get a shadow on the screen. Real. Um, so as Martin says, I think we've uh, what I'm trying to do today. Um, I hope. Uh, I'm guessing not too many of you were at CanvasCon. There will be some overlap with what I did there. Um, but what I want to do is tell you a little bit of the story of uh, how we started to change the way we deliver apprenticeships. And that's over the last you know, three years in total, but particularly the last two years of that with Canvas. A um, bit of the why. Um, I'm not going to necessarily get too deep into the technology of Canvas, but I will touch on the, the bits we particularly find in Canvas compared to other BLEs, but also to tell you our experiences. Um, love to have your questions. Um, so as as you as you think of them, put them into the chat box, and, and as Martin says, I'll pick them up at the end. Um, if there's a, a natural break, I'll try and pick some up as we go along as well. So. I know at least one person I've noticed on the call knows plenty about QA. But for those who don't, um, we're now, oh, I should have updated this slide, we're now over 5,000 apprentices on program, so we're a, a pretty good sized apprenticeship provider these days. Um, we really come from a heritage in, in technical training, in IT, and that's still the majority of our apprenticeship programs, although increasing breadth in our portfolio. Um, to cover things like project management, leadership, um, digital marketing, etc. Um, we, uh, we 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 we've also got this much wider scope to the QA group, which which includes short course training in in what we call QA learning, and also a higher education division that does undergrad, postgrad, higher education. So um, it, it's. Uh, quite a broad group and I think the reason just to share this to start with is to say until two years ago we had, you know, had that number of four at that time three and a half four thousand apprentices on program but it was it, it really was we were delivering high-tech skills so we're teaching people you know cutting in stuff whether it's cyber security software development digital marketing doing it incredibly traditional way at QA. It was still overwhelmingly a classroom experience and equally in the world of uh, in the world of apprenticeships there was assessors doing one-to-one -one visits field based on the road but actually it, it was you know that was the core bit of the of, of what we did was very much face to face in whatever method that was. So I think that was one big driver for us is, is recognizing that we needed to, to think differently about delivery model. I think the other thing that's coming along for us that's that's really sharpened our mind was this sense that we'd spent an enormous amount of our time historically and still just you know still spent a lot of it 
it's actually developing materials for learning and, and we talk about QA authored materials a lot. But increasingly, and I think especially as we move online, content is, is freely available in a way it never has been before. You know, we're moving away from uh, publishers and textbooks and frankly, you know, almost an expensive starting point with content to both individuals and companies having this really ready access. Everything from the free stuff, but equally uh, the paid options through things here. I've you know, included things like Pluralsight and Linda and LinkedIn Learning. Um, you know, they're, they're inexpensive. They give you access to content. So if we're thinking about ourselves as primarily a content provider in an education sense, actually we're limiting our thinking about who we should be. Um, my uh, my analogy really, and my look in looking at another sector is is a very very big sector was was retail, and and I, I've got this sense that where we are with education and, and certainly in apprenticeships is sort of where retail was maybe 10 years ago, in terms of actually, you know, at that point we had overwhelmingly a bricks and mortar model of retail, still. Um, but what we then start to find is those that have been really successful in, in understanding what's going on in, in the change in the way people shop are those who've understood omnichannel retailing where they make it easy for, shop, in this case, shoppers to shop as and when they want online and offline. And as you can see, the ones going the other way for me are those that, that resolutely try to stick with an old style way of retailing didn't go particularly well for them. And then, as the, you know, my interesting last case is starting to see these mergers between the pure online player of someone like Amazon, who you know, really dominate that space, now f actually looking how do we how do we get a different way of doing this? So that's my analogy. Really, is the omni-channel retailing, and then this idea of seamless blended learning. As I look at when we looked at this market, we've got people like. Uh, LinkedIn, Linda, the MOOCs, the edX platforms um, down here. And then we've got the traditional education space, but actually there's a huge gap in the middle for, for in our view, for, that we wanted to really get is how do you make this seamless rather than separate online content and face-to-face -face experience that doesn't necessarily join up particularly well. And just to further extend the analogy, this is my, uh, this is, um, Research from from Harvard Business Review, uh, which is about retailing again, um, where they talked to a really large sample of shoppers and actually said, "Well, how do you shop?" And, and, and as you can see here, you've only got 20% uh, of people who said, "I only ever shop in a, in a physical store." You've then got 7% of people who said, "I only ever shop online. I never go to a, I never go to a shop." But actually, the overwhelming majority of people, unsurprisingly, say, "I do a bit of both. I I uh, mix up looking for stuff on the web, looking stuff on the phone, click and collect. I sometimes look in the shop, but don't buy it there. Go and get it delivered. All those sorts of things. And, and that's how you know that's our view of where where learning is going." And particularly when you look at uh, some of the, uh, the immediate opportunities around apprenticeships and, and, and the challenges, but a lot of the opportunities, is that's our baseline. That's as we go into this journey with Canvas, is saying we think that's how everyone wants to learn, which is they want us to create a seamless online, offline experience for them that enables them to learn flexibly in the way they want on their phones, on their devices but then to still have that unique face-to-face -face experience for the right things that they need it for. Uh, just a bit of fun, really, <laughs> um, of uh, a, few of, a few of the chief execs of now uh, some of defunct businesses and what they said. Uh, Ed Colligan of Palm Pilot, who, who thought uh, Apple could never really work out how to make a phone. Uh, famously, the guy uh, Jim Keyes from Blockbuster, who, who thought Netflix weren't really a threat, and then uh, you, might not, I think I've got a you might not be able to quite be able to see that. And and just two, was it three months ago? Uh, the CEO of Foot Locker saying we don't, we're not really worried about vendors selling shoes on Amazon. 
I sort of would be worried if I were you. Right. Um, that's a typewriter, uh, apparently. It's been a while. Um, uh, I think the reason for uh, the visual cue here for us is that we, we did start we started our blending learning journey and spent about a year using another VLE, uh, and, and this is being recorded, so I'm not going to name it. Um, but what we found pretty quickly is, is it was sort of okay as a storage and documentation uh, model, but what it didn't give us is that opportunity to create engagement and learning online and interactions and to do all the things we wanted to do around seamless blended learning. So that's where really um, we we then started looking around and and key thing for us was finding Canvas at that point, which one I think really uh, had a lot of clear water in terms of how easy it was from a UI point of view, both for our apprentices, but also I think crucially for our for our staff who are building courses and designing content, the flexibility it gave them to make individual online courses and blended courses work in the way they wanted them to. You know, everything from inline video to the number of the uh, the LTI apps, so this, this um, interoperable app store that enables us to do lots of interesting things, whether it's around how to do maths modules in a different way, but equally just the opportunity to, to extend Canvas quickly and flexibly. So um, that uh, that sense of trying to do all the right things but with the wrong VLE we found hampered us in the early days. Um, uh, I said I said part of our uh, a bit of, bit of this was part of our story. I don't you know without guessing where everyone's starting point is. Um, I would say we started three years ago with just a sense of uh, a bit of a sense that we needed to do it and a, a huge dose of naivety, frankly. Uh, about about where to start. Um, we we certainly didn't come in with having uh, a ton of blended learning experience, uh, a huge amount of understanding of the science or the 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 right way to do blended learning. I'd say more than anything else, we we started fairly small, so we started on degree apprenticeships, and we started with a small group who were not afraid to just try things out. And we pretty much plugged Canvas in on a Monday morning and got a whole group of us together and started uh, really, in, in the technical sense of the word, hacking courses together just to see what was possible and see how we could do things. I think actually that sense of experimentation has been really important to us, um, which I think we've maintained almost on this term by term, quarter by quarter basis, is always going back and going, what, what can we do next? What can we extend about the way we use Canvas? What are all these unexplored features that we haven't used, but suddenly they have a need? We've got a business requirement from our customers for them. And that's probably been a really important part of this, is, is that does sound like experiment, that is experimentation. But we've taken a real strong cue from our client base and our apprentices on what they wanted, which I think you know, was absolutely in, in the context of degree apprenticeships. They, they were saying to us, particularly at this point in their career and the later points of degree apprenticeship, we've got productive people with real day jobs and what we need from a degree apprenticeship is a different way to provide both flexible learning, uh, a real ability to connect that learning to the workplace, but then to organise our work and time around the changing dynamics of our role. You know, you never know which week's going to be hugely busy, which day where something's going to kick off to give us a way of learning that's flexible. I think then the other thing was going, we love the face-to-face -face bits, but make sure that it's unique. The things that you can only do when you have a group and a face-to-face -face environment, whether that's uh, technical elements or whether it's group work, to really, they gave us a real direction to focus on that. So when we're starting to think about how we organize blended learning, that was one of the other key things, is to make sure that the digital stuff the right things to be done that way, but equally the workshops, the face-to-face, -face, the immersives are the right things to do that way. Um, and I think the, probably the, the last thing on in this, this little category for us was 
a lot of the things that people said they liked about apprenticeships, the uniqueness of apprenticeship compared to other forms of education they wanted us to keep, was the sense that it's fundamentally practical. And so when we thought about the online learning, some of the criticisms and, and the bad experiences people have had in the past was where it's very dominated by content. And so our key ethos in, in what we're doing here is to try and really all make sure that everything we do, every week of content has, yes, a little bit of content, but more importantly, is all about then being backed up with something to do, whether it's a practical exercise, whether it's group work, whether it's discussion boards, but it's it's got that sense of active learning in it and, and importantly connecting it back to what's what's workplace and what's my context on a day to day point of view. Okay, there might be a, a small natural pause there, so I'm just gonna have a look at um see if there's any questions. None on the chat just yet. So I'll carry on. Yeah, please do. If you get, have the questions as you go, please uh, please do throw them in. Okay. So right. So uh, I'm sure uh, I'm guessing all most or all of of you on the call are already delivering apprenticeships or know a bit about them. Uh, and and for us, there's always the, the core challenge, I think, in some ways, of apprenticeships compared to full-time, you know, that full-time education model, is we don't, relatively, we don't see that much of our apprentices. You don't have this experience where they're in the building or on campus and you can just grab people and you get this sense of seeing them regularly. And I think that's always been one of the, you know, challenges for apprenticeship providers. It's about how do we... Um, track progress in a more meaningful way than you know than we have been able to previously. Uh, before blended learning, we were very much organised around those assessors and those skills coaches with their visits and their uh, learner progress reviews, which were face to face, um, plus you know the feedback from our uh, teaching sessions. I'd say the single biggest thing we found about the way we run our business, so as well as I think giving our customers a better experience in blended learning, that how we run what we do from a quality and operational point of view has been Google has been Google Analytics, sorry, Canvas Analytics, um, and and the level of detail it gives us. So the, my example here is previously we often might not have known that an apprentice has become disengaged with the content for a four to six week period because we that's not unusual to not see an apprentice for for that sort of six week period. Particularly the silent disengagement. Not the ones who scream and say everything's going wrong, but the ones who just quietly disengage. What we found, I think, more than anything here is because we've one organized all of our blended content into weekly chapters, and it's not just here's the content, it's you've got to do something every week, is it gives us a whole level of data and a huge early warning system that enables us to say, actually, who should we be spending more time with? So our example here is on our degree apprenticeship. Every Monday morning we run this data, we look at the data, and what we're then doing is getting our teaching team to review it and then to identify, most importantly, those who haven't engaged and uh, in the online material for a period of two weeks. So if we're saying, we'll let you have, we start, pay, one week is going to happen, but at two weeks we start to pay some attention, and at four weeks we really are putting in some quite detailed interventions for those people to say, right, can we help you get back on track? And this sense, this set of data has been incredibly powerful for us. I think we've, we've spotted so many problems early in modules, early in a term, early in the process and being able to have those discussions with employers and with apprentices at the right time. Um, and particularly, you know, a 10 week, for example, a 10 week module, you know, if you, for, we find an apprentice loses four weeks, so it's very hard to catch up. So those early interventions are, are absolutely crucial. And I do think that's 
been borne out in how we've retained apprentices on blended learning programs. Um, so in our example here is degree apprentices and you know, the risk with a degree apprenticeship is it is they're four years long and actually that's a long time to retain someone for. But at the moment we're running out of 350 degree apprentices, we've got 97 and a bit percent of those still on program. And, and I'm, I'm uh, certain that there's a direct link between our understanding of the data, our ability to act quickly to re-engage learners with that retention stat. I think equally the outcomes have been really strong. I think a lot of that speaks to the unique power of degree apprenticeships, but I also think blended learning has suited fundamentally the program, which is why we're, we're running at a, uh, an average grade in the mid two ones across a, a really quite significant group of apprentices. So that's analytics. Um, uh, I mentioned uh, a little uh, couple of slides back about the ease with which we've been able to integrate third party tools with Canvas. Uh, and an example here is um, particularly less on our degree apprenticeships, but we're now more talking about our level three and level four apprenticeships. There was a particular type of progress tracking um, towards the portfolios and, and now towards the gateway point, which uh, which we wanted. We'd always used eTrack and we wanted to retain some of the uh, some of the functionality in there. Um, so here we've been able to work, uh, in a sense, to get Canvas uh, Canvas and eTrack working together, where uh, Tribal, who own eTrack, have developed a, uh, an LTI integration and now we can see that progress tracking data that historically would have been in separate application of eTrack now within Canvas within the frame and that directly links uh, data where um, for example now uh, SpeedGrader which is the uh, probably the t certainly the teacher's favorite bit of Canvas um, all of the marking of portfolio work as well as classroom work is all done in SpeedGrader and that data now flows through into eTrack to give this sense, this uh, bang up to date um, framework progress tracking here. Uh, yeah, good question on an, on an acronym, sorry, LTI stands for, oh, here you go, uh, Learning Tools Interoperability, he says pretty confidently. Um, uh, and the idea is that there's a uh, there's an app store which is growing regularly, particularly uh, applications linked to education. So that can be content providers, um, particular assessment models, badging, um, uh, badging platforms. I'm trying to think of some more. All sorts of different things that might that are related to the world of education and BLE. And then the LTI. Um, uh, the LTI system then enables that to effectively with uh, a very, very simple process to integrate it with Canvas in a way that it just appears either as an additional piece of navigation on the left hand side, but it all sits within and that in mo almost all cases there's some, some level of data integration as well. So that's been, uh, I think, hugely beneficial in terms of uh, being able to do some of the interesting stuff we want to do with different tools, different different bits. There you go. Manuel Manuel's uh, given the full lick at Edu App Center. Um, so, but yeah, no, eTrack have built one of those. Thank you for the question. And uh, uh, black mark for me for using acronyms. Um, I think this is, uh, in some sense, was a little bit of a hobby horse for us, but I think um, I think I certainly know the number of other apprenticeship providers who are on the same journey. The other thing we've we've been uh, really had our heart set on with Canvas is to get as close to a completely paperless delivery as we possibly could, um, and we started that with this degree apprenticeship program. Um, Key things I think to start with, we've absolutely got, uh, we don't 
We don't print materials in the classrooms anymore. We expect all of those materials to be available on screen. Um, obviously, assignments are online, but they're not only handed in online, they're marked online, they're second marked online, they're moderated online, the moderation forms are online, and it's then all made available to our university partner through Canvas. So there's no separate flow. In fact, it's not just paperless, it's all inside Canvas. Um, I said 99% paperless. We are uh, working on getting the uh, the ILR and the commitment statements uh, to be uh, fully digital as well. Once we do that, maybe sometime next year, I'll stand in front of everyone bravely and say that we're 100% paperless. Um, we can't quite stop people printing stuff, but we don't need at any point anyone to use a piece of paper to complete the degree apprenticeship, which I think is uh, a pretty pretty key uh, key milestone for us. Uh, and also digital textbooks as well. So we use uh, we use two different digital textbook providers. We use uh, Core Text and we use Books 24/7 by Skillsoft to provide all of those uh, texts as digital. And again, they're integrated into Canvas in a in a pretty seamless way. So they're not sending so we're not sending people off to another platform. Uh, certainly not obviously anyway. Just have a so now, uh, just as we get the last sort of uh, five or so minutes, just to give you a sense of where we where we now want to go, I think we'd say we made a, a good start with blended learning. In a sense, just enough of a start to work out all the things we don't know and all the things we aren't quite doing right. And I think that's where we're now talking about what we've done so far is we, we, we're doing a bit of digital learning, but it then starts to have all the knock-on effects, both uh, forced effects, but also then some, some new opportunities uh, about where we can go. And it's this idea that we're starting to map out a couple of waves of digital change that we can see coming. So as well as the way we teach, we see huge opportunities here in thinking, like I said, about digital operations. So how do we make uh, effectively everything that we do is more self-service, or easily available online, much less of it requiring an email or a phone call to get things done. Uh, but equally then, when we get down to the back office, is it, you know, blended learning fundamentally changes roles for our trainers, our lecturers. You know, where they would normally have expected to spend almost all of their time in a classroom, actually, uh, some of our roles are already spending more than 50% of their time doing online and remote support, which is a much more flexible existence, but it's also a different way of measuring goodness. We don't necessarily just measure how many days people spend in the classroom or uh, how many hours a week. That's, that's the wrong measure. And so thinking about our business in a different way. Uh, I've already mentioned uh, how powerful uh, Canvas Analytics has been for us. I think we see an enormous, uh, uh, enormous amount more we can do with the data we're now getting to really go to a next detail of not just the people engaging, but then starting to combine that with things like Google Analytics, with heat mapping, with uh, correlating their engagement data with their backgrounds to understand what is it that that means uh, apprentices are either more likely or less likely to engage. And then ultimately, the, the key thing we want is to link that to achievement. So does it then start to give us some early indicators, some predictive analytics that enables us to target people for, to improve our retention and our achievement rates, which are incredibly important to us? So just a little bit of an example of how yeah, we found that once we started on this blended learning journey, as I say, somewhat naively, we've now started to realize actually it changes many other things about how we operate as a provider, as a business. Uh, uh, and, then, and then just a little bit about where we see, uh, where we see things going next. Uh, as I said, uh, you know, really read into this. It's now the web and learning are, are intertwined. It's, it's almost impossible to separate. We can't say uh, one day it will get disrupted. It, it, it's already happening. Um, and, and in that spirit, really, starting to borrow ideas from from the world of 
uh, of web development and web design and see how we use those in the way we develop education. So historically, as I said, it's very content orientated approach to education. We've done that here at QA. But as we move online, it goes from being this idea that in the early days of the web, everyone just put their catalog on their website. And, and to a certain extent, we've done a bit of that. We've just put our existing materials on Canvas to start with. What we've realized is that there's, that's obviously uh, uh, the least thoughtful approach we could take. What we're now starting to do is to think more about how do we create a much more interactive learning experience for our apprentices. And the tool set we're starting to use for that is, is from, this world of, from the world of the web is this idea of user experience design but then contextualizing that specifically around learning. And here it's, it's really working much more closely with our apprentices to talk to them, to understand how they want to learn, how they want to use the systems, and getting this sense of designing a module to be an overall joined up experience rather than a collection of content. And, and this is uh, something that we're now starting to build into our I guess our tutors and our lecturers tool set and getting them to actively run these sorts of sessions with our apprentices at the end of modules to gather feedback to help us iterate to help us improve the design of our modules particularly those that we're doing on online blended on canvas so that's the first thing uh, and I think the second thing we're we're really excited about is this idea of how can we then join up the world of work with learning from an apprenticeship point of view and, and can we use uh, either problem-based or challenge-based learning to give apprentices uh, a sort of semi-structured scaffolded way to apply their newly found skills and knowledge but instead of it being straight into a live environment at work they get a they get this challenge-based learning opportunity where they're they're seeing what works, they get to experience that, they get to work in a group, they get to work on a live project. Um, in, a, in an almost, uh, in a highly realistic sense, where they are in control of their learning and thinking about things that are quite big rather than lots of small individual exercises. So that's the second thing we've, we're now you know, starting to look at from how we deliver learning and how we make that work from an apprenticeship point of view. Um, and, and again, you know, these are the, the sort of things, the, the, the key thing of having Canvas, having a top VLE in place, is it enables us to think fairly big about how we want to design learning, partly because we don't feel any constraint of the VLE, but we know that it's got the same mindset around engagement, about interaction, about user experience being at the, uh, at the top of uh, most important things when Canvas is being designed and improved. So there you go, that's, uh, I think that's all I was wanted to, to say in my bit. Uh, it's about 30, 35 minutes of me. Um, so as we come towards yeah, the end of that bit, if anyone's got any questions that they either want to put into the chat box or indeed to unmute themselves and, and to ask questions in front of the forum, it'd be, uh, that'd be great. So. Let me have a look what's on the chat first. So thanks for, for sharing your strategy, Ben. That's been really informative, really fascinating of use of Canvas. Um, I know that obviously lots of our customers use Canvas in different ways, but I think this is a really, really good case case of using Canvas in a really, really good structured way. And I really like how you've been providing timely interventions for your, for your, for your apprentices. What, what's your current uh, retention rate? Did you mention it during the webinar? Yeah, so, um, so to, on degree apprenticeship specifically, which is where we started with Canvas and blended learning, we're retaining, uh, so over, over two year period, with 350 degree apprentices on program, we've retained over 97% of them so far. So uh, that's the stat, you know. Got to keep them all the way to the end, of course. You never, never get, uh, never get cocky about retention. Um, but yeah, it's a, we think that's a pretty good start. That's really good. And we'll be sharing these slides with attendees after um, once we've got the recording as well, and we'll be sending that recording on. 
So if you do have any questions, now you have your time to uh, throw them in. If you'd like to know any more information about campus specifically, uh, how we can support your learners, then uh, please let us know when we contact you. Uh, one of our team of regional directors are more than happy to uh, speak to you directly or to come in and do a bespoke demonstration of Canvas. So there's a few different options. You can actually sign up for a free trial of Canvas using that link which is on the screen at the moment. I think if you just Google Canvas VLE free for teachers, uh, you'll get there as well and find that link. You'll get presented with two different options which are Try it, which is a 14-day trial of Canvas, which already has some learners already in there and some content built into Canvas, so you can see what it looks like fully built out. You can have a play with it, uh, and then we can talk to you directly if, if you wanted. And there's also a, on a blank Canvas, which is the build it option, which is, is literally just a free version of Canvas that you can use for, for one course. And you can go in and add a few learners and start building it out and see what it looks like and feels like with some of your learners. Um, we've got another webinar actually in two weeks time with Cube Learning. Um, they're doing some similar stuff to what QA are doing and they're not as far ahead on, the, on their journey. I think they, they signed up to Canvas around six months ago. Uh, but in response to the apprenticeship levy, Cube are moving and changing the, the way that they deliver their vocational education. It's much more of a, a training model, moving away from more of an assessment or assessing, really. And I know that's part of the new standards, the apprenticeship standards. And so they're going to put using Canvas for the 20% off the job training. And Canvas is really a very really good tool to be able to do that. So is there any questions? I don't think there is at this point. So I have a question for you, uh, Martin. Or rather okay. for Ben, it's Richard Horton here. Hi. Hello, Richard. Yeah, hi Ben. A uh, really great presentation. Um, Thank you. It's great to see how, how you know you've moved these last couple of years. I had a quick question. I like the, the slide at the end. You start talking about challenge-based uh, sort of learning, and yeah, and I, I guess that's got close uh, 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 connections with sort of competency-based. Do you see in the in the future um, apprentice apprenticeships apprentices or or the companies that they're going to work for? Really building their own programs of study by selecting challenges or competences from a group, really building their own individual um, sort of yeah programs of study linked specifically to the job and the career they have in mind. Yeah, it's um, uh, I think for us, uh, the, yeah, the bit that's really exciting I think around challenge-based learning is uh, let me try and think of a good example of where we're where we're at at the moment. So, for example, on management degree apprenticeships, um, everyone's always taught people a module about finance, you know, and accounting. I think that's, you know, since the beginning of time, every manager needs to have an introductory, you know, finance for non-finance people. In the past, what you've always, uh, I think this, hang on, I'll just check. Yeah, no, I think this all works. Um, so. In the past, you typically then got given some other company's accounts. So you might get given, I don't know, everyone always likes to case study Apple. Here's Apple's accounts. Go and work through theirs. Um, but actually, what you're doing is spending your time worrying about somebody else's business. Whereas in an apprenticeship, the, the uniqueness and what we're trying to do with challenge-based learning is where you take the concept, the core idea, the core skill, and then you apply it into your context into your unique work-based problems. And there, for example, the finance module is a good example. You take something that generally people are, might not be their favorite module. And if we can use challenge-based learning to get them to connect the, you know, the valuable bits of theory with, right, go and take this and do this and then this and then this and then this with your own company and come out from the end of it with some insight and an action plan. It then starts to get this bit. I think that we're saying is that, that it fundamentally means that the learning you're doing is immediately benefiting your day job. And so, yeah, as well as as well as giving people the flexibility around choosing different topics and choosing different challenges, I think the bit the, the special bit you can do with apprenticeships is that um, is that bit about joining you know day to day context with the new skills you're getting. So that. I know slightly different 
to what you said, but I think that's that's where we're really excited about it. But I think joining, you're joining yeah. up. I think what you're saying is you're you're being speci- you're, you are creating specific programs. You're not putting apprent- apprenticeships, apprentices, or, or managers, or whatever, onto courses where they've got to retake lots of stuff they already know just because that's the course curriculum. You're able to yeah. provide them with the specific training they re- uh, they require, the specific challenges, if you like, that they're facing day to day, and and mould it to their particular environment. I think that's really really cool, by the way. Thank you, and I think. Uh, similarly, when content's so easily available, um, we don't add as much value now in terms of telling people to do these chapters, these 10 chapters, 1 to 10. It's much more important for us to help find some good content for people and say, you might want to do it in this order or that order, or you might not need any of it, but you might need some of it. Um, but we yeah, get less obsessed by week-by-week uh, week rundown of content and much more about what is it you need to achieve with it and how to move around that. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Ben, do you think that's going to be important for your relationship with your employers as well? That they're going to, that's going to be a selling point for your business when you're recruiting apprentices that they're actually yeah. going to be doing real world problems and actually solving business problems for that employer? Yeah, I mean especially with the 20% off the job requirement I think. Yeah, that's a, I think I'm sure I'm sure we're not the only ones where you know, the conversations about um, actually that's a very real cost to the business. So when people are off, you know, doing 20% of their time as learning, I think it's absolutely crucial that that we think as a as a as a group of providers, as an industry, about how do we make that 20% most immediately applicable back to work, and that's not to make it any less. Of a learning experience. In fact, my, I guess this is our point. It's what we're passionate about. It's making it a much more powerful learning experience. It really sharpens our mind that what they use that 20% for must then, you know, if they're doing that on a Monday afternoon, that they then pick up on Tuesday morning and go, great, that stuff I did yesterday, I'm going to put into practice today, and it's immediately part of my uh, my day-to-day reality. So. Yeah, I think that's it. And the 20% is a huge cost for employers, uh, probably even uh, at least as much as the levy itself. Yeah, so if there's no questions, then uh, I think we'll wrap up. But really, thanks a lot, Ben. Really appreciate you joining us today and sharing your strategy. Um, So yeah, I don't think we've got any extra questions. so, So thanks a lot. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye then. Thanks all. Thank you. Bye bye.